Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. Today we continue our Star Wars Clone Wars history series. For those of you who don't know, we've split the series into four different seasons, which will cover each year of the war. Now, if you're interested in watching all the videos we've done so far in the series, please hit the playlist right there. We've put all the videos in there in chronological order. In our last episode, R2-D2 has been captured by General Grievous, and we see what great lengths Anakin will go to save his droid. It shows us what kind of individual Anakin was, and more importantly, how different he is from Obi-Wan Kenobi and the more mainstream views of the Jedi Council. It's only the beginning of a shift we'll see in Anakin as he drifts further and further away from the Jedi and closer to a completely different ideology. Meanwhile, the war is going relatively bad for the Republic. Completely outnumbered from the outset of the war, things are only getting worse as the Republic is unable to really protect their entire territory. If you think about it, even the Galactic Empire had some serious problems protecting the entire galaxy, even with their far larger navy and Death Star. The Separatist Alliance had the advantage of being on the offensive. They simply had to keep the Republic off balance and attack them where their strength wasn't. But the battles being fought between admirals and generals weren't the only battles going on in the galaxy. On another playing field, senators and diplomats from both sides courted neutral worlds and tried to use political favors and trade deals in the hope that these methods will succeed before blasters and tanks are necessary. Or so hoped idealists like Senator Padme Amidala of the Republic or Senator Mina Bonteri of the Confederacy. Shortly after the Battle of Batu Wai, Padme Amidala travels to the homeworld of the Rodians, known as Rodia. For those of you who don't know what a Rodian is, Greedo is one. The Rodians, like Twi'leks, are commonly found in the rougher parts of the galaxy, doing the rougher jobs. It's not racist for me to say this, guys. It's specious. And it's also grounded in some truth. You see, Rodia, like Ryloth, wasn't the most hospitable planet. It lay in the Outer Rim nearby Tatooine and the Twi'lek homeworld. Rodia was once a humid jungle, rich in flora and fauna. But eventually, one lizard species developed the ability to walk on two legs, start using melee weapons, which then turned into guns, which then turned into bombs, and then, well, you had a modern society. But unfortunately for the Rodians, they were degenerates, and they turned their entire world into a toxic wasteland, and the survivors had to retreat into domed cities. This naturally left Rodia very vulnerable to major changes in the galaxy. They were no longer self-sufficient and depended on other planets for basic resources. Most recently, for instance, one of their uh, supply convoys was destroyed by pirates, which created a food shortage crisis on their planet. The Rodians had felt betrayed that the Republic was unable to stop the pirates or send any emergency supplies when they requested some. Senator Anakata Farr represented the Rodian people and also happened to be very close friends with Rui Nabari, former Naboo senator and father of Padme Amidala. The two were actually quite close allies and growing up, Padme actually called Anakata Uncle Ono. The senator had personally requested help from Padme after his pleas were ignored by the Republic. In defense of the Galactic Republic, their resources were already stretched thin across the galaxy. They were completely unprepared for the war. In a smaller world like Rodia, in the outer rim of the galaxy and behind enemy lines was kind of low priority for them at this point. As a matter of fact, Padme had greatly risked her life to come so far, especially without a military convoy. Her reason for coming so far without any kind of escort was that this was a mission of diplomacy and peace. Although she did bring junior senator from Naboo, the Gungan Jar Jar. After the invasion of Naboo and the heroic sacrifice of the Gungans, the Naboo had granted the Swamp People representation in their planet affairs. Jar Jar Binks, for some reason, was chosen. I'm sure Chancellor Palpatine had some influence in the matter, but like our three in our last episode, Jar Jar Binks was almost actively going out of the way to put Padme and the entire mission in danger. Upon arriving to the Rodian system, Jar Jar accidentally hits a button which almost destroys the ship. Padme, who is perhaps a little bit less trusting than Anakin, decides to keep the Gungan on the ship while she attends to the more delicate diplomacy matters. After all, Uncle Ono and her shared some very close personal ties, which will definitely help smooth over the talks. Senator Anaconda Far was in a tough position. The Republic, as always, was not only too slow to respond to the crisis on Rodeo, it had postponed the vote that would have approved aid for the planet in the first place. With his constituents literally dying, Senator Far had to get help any way he could. Although he was a staunch loyalist to the Republic and Padme, when Newt Gunray and the Trade Federation secretly approached the Rodians with a promise of immediate relief, there was nothing really the Senator could do but save his people. 
And not only were the Separatists promising to give them emergency relief, they were also going to give them new trade ships to replace the ones that were destroyed, and new warships that would guard their trade routes. The only problem with this deal was that Anaconda Far had to attract Senator Amidala to the planet so that the Separatists could arrest her. Now, normally I would say it's kind of wrong to detain a political figure or a diplomat like Padme Amidala, but she's not really just the diplomat anymore, is she? At this point, we have to kind of accept that Padme is basically an enemy combatant hiding behind the guise of a senator. Just a few weeks ago, she was partly responsible for wiring the nav computer of a subjugator class heavy cruiser, which led to it flying directly into a moon, destroying millions if not billions of credits worth of war material. Not really actions of a diplomat, more like that of a saboteur. But before we judge Senator Anaconda far as just another sketchy roadie and you won't want your kids hanging around, we have to understand that his people were literally dying from starvation. And we have to also understand that New Gunray, as usual, lied about the part where he wasn't going to harm Padme. I guess the question we have to ask is, would Uncle Ono still have done the same thing had he known the Trade Federation's true intentions? The one thing that is clear is you should really never trust any political deal that the Confederacy or the Trade Federation gives you. They're basically like telemarketers. Meanwhile, Jar Jar is trying to get acquainted with the local wildlife. C-3PO, as usual, shows an acute understanding of the dangers of his surroundings and warns the Gungan not to do so. I know he's made up to be a coward in the larger scheme of things, but I've always seen C-3PO as a voice of reason. I mean, he's really surrounded by a completely reckless and idiotic people who actually usually do end up dying in very terrible ways, so I think C-3PO is kind of a hero in the entire Star Wars saga. Anyway, Jar Jar is using his usual mix of nonsensical phrases and words and somehow manages to communicate with the local animals. Look guys, I'm not a zoologist or a swamp animal, or a swamp animal who also is a zoologist, but I find it very unlikely that a swamp animal from one planet would be able to communicate with another swamp animal in a completely different solar system and completely different planets. Just doesn't make any sense. Most likely what's happening here is Jar Jar is communicating or betting this animal towards his will by using the Force. The dark side of the Force. And when the Separatist droids come to secure Senator Amidala's ship, Jar Jar uses his usual drunken kung fu slash fool's capoeira to defeat the droids in a seemingly clumsy fashion. That I assure you is all for show and all carefully calculated and choreographed by this evil mastermind. Here's an individual who is so powerful in the force and such a terrific combatant that he is able to hide behind some clown act and still win the battle. Meanwhile, Uncle Ono feels more and more guilty as Separatists chain his symbolic niece to a wall in a dungeon. He's probably having buyer's remorse at this point. But hey, he's an elected official and he really has to do what's right for his constituents before anything else. Because that's how it works in America. Meanwhile, Jar Jar has destroyed Senator Amidala's ship because that's what the guy does. The Gungan finds a pair of Jedi robes on board, most likely Anakin's, and proceeds to go on an epic rescue mission and bumps into New Gunright right as he arrives on the planet to take Padme into custody. The Separatists, of course, mistaken the Gungan for a Jedi and immediately go on high alert. By this point, Uncle Ono's buyer's remorse turns into, oh damn, I want my money back. He realizes that Newt Gunray doesn't just want to detain Padme, he wants to kill her. And worse yet, the Separatists won't even consider sending aid until Senator Padme is executed. But Padme, again, is no damsel in distress or a diplomat. She's an enemy combatant and a very capable one at that, and manages to escape herself. She links up with C-3PO and together the two formulate a plan. While Padme goes and helps Jar Jar, C-3PO goes to try to contact Republic forces and manages to do so right before he's captured. Padme is also captured and together they're brought in front of New Gunright who wants to execute them by Droidica. But at the last minute, Jedi Jar Jar, or Sith Jar Jar more likely, comes to the rescue. In the skirmish that ensues, Senator Anakata gets hold of a blaster and has both Padme and New Gunray in his sights. He gets a second chance to choose a side in the war. Padme, never letting her emotions and revenge get in the way, seizes on the moment and gives Uncle Anno a way out by suggesting he had always meant to betray New Gunray to the Republic in the first place. And that's exactly what the Senator does. See, you can never trust a dirty Rodian. The Republic eventually arrives and New Gunray is taken into custody. Meanwhile, Senator Palpatine finally agrees to send some aid to the Rodians now that they've finally gotten the attention of the Republic. Interestingly enough, the capture of Newt Gunray doesn't imply that the entire Trade Federation has betrayed the Republic. Other members of the Trade Federation had devoured Gunray as an extremist, 
this, of course, is nonsense, the Trade Federation was definitely in cahoots with the Separatists. Everyone in the Republic more or less knew this, but that's just how desperate the Republic was. They couldn't afford to even lose a system that was actively betraying them. Now, things are already in freefall in the Outer Rim, and as bad as things are on Rhodia, at least their senator has connections to a plot-critical senator. Other planets like Minbum have turned into gigantic wastelands strewn with body parts and droid parts. Well, guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe, hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our Clone Wars history series. As usual, thanks for joining us today. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.